Welcome to part two of the final lecture of the series of lectures on training neural networks. In part one, we looked at a few techniques for enhancing the smoothness of the function learned by the network. We saw how we could do this by shrinking the weights or by making the network deeper. In addition to these, a number of other regularization techniques have been proposed to improve the smoothness of the learning function, such as L1 regularization of network activations or adding noise to the input. In that context, possibly the most influential regularization method has been dropout. So let's look at, look at that next. But first, let me digress briefly to a popular machine learning technique called bagging proposed by Leo Breiner. The idea here is to use the training data to build several classifiers and ensemble them. The way we train the classifiers is by sampling the training data. Each classifier is built on a different sample. Test instances are now classified using each of these classifiers. And then we vote across the classifier outputs for the, for the final classification. So this figure on top shows the overall approach. Bagging is known to improve performance significantly over training a single classifier from the entire training data. So now returning to our problem, dropout is a training method where in each iteration, for each input, we randomly turn off or drop out some of the neurons in the net with some probability one minus alpha. So each neuron is either retained with a probability alpha or it is switched off with a probability one minus alpha. So if we began with this network, as soon as we receive an input, we flip a virtual coin that has probability of heads alpha for each neuron. If that neuron, if that coin turns up a head, we retain the neuron. If it turns up a tail, we remove the neuron for the network. We basically switch the neuron off. Practically speaking, the virtual coin will be a Bernoulli random number generator with probability of success alpha. We do this not just for the neurons in the network, we also do this for components of the input as well. Consequently, the actual network that processes an input may be like this one, which has only a subset of the total neurons in the network operating on a subset of the input components. Of course, we won't explicitly remove the neurons. What we will do is to peg their outputs to zero so that they no longer contribute anything to the computation. So in this case, all of these elements in black represent, zero, represent units that have been switched off and their output has been pegged to zero. The key is that the specific set of units that are switched off will be different for different inputs. We randomly select the inputs and neurons to switch off afresh for each input. So for instance, here, for each of these three inputs, x1, x2, and x3, we are switching off different portions of the network. So each of these inputs effectively sees a different network. Even for the same input, we will have different switch off patterns and different iterations so that that input sees different effective nets in each iteration. For each input, we only compute the derivatives for the weights for edges that connect to neurons that have not been switched off. So the parameters of the connections that actually remain. The gradients for the remaining terms are set to zero. We will update the parameters with the gradients computed in this manner on these reduced networks. The statistical motivation that's generally offered to justify dropout is that it's some sort of bagging. For a network that has a total of n neurons, each of the neurons can be switched on or off. So there are two raised to n possible sub-networks that we can compose simply by switching on and off the neurons. The argument is that dropout samples over these two raised to n possible networks. So the network seen by each input is one of these two raised to n possible networks that you can compose from this guy. However, the two raised to n networks are not all independent, but share parameters. And the final network we learn effectively averages 
over all 2 raised to n possible networks. So we're getting the benefits of bagging. There's also a second explanation why dropout works. When we just train a network in the usual manner, there is no explicit constraint that forces each layer to actually learn something. So for instance, one of the layers might just learn to clone the output of the previous layer. So effectively, although in this example we have four layers, we only effectively have three layers because the second layer is simply cloning the output of the first layer. This can result in a loss of structure in the network, effective structure in the network. By randomly switching off neurons, dropout ensures that neurons don't learn such simple, trivial relationships, but actually learn to recognize denser, more informative patterns. So here's how we would implement dropout. During the forward pass, we run a Bernoulli random number generator with success probability alpha to compute a mask. If the generator outputs a zero, the mask value becomes zero, effectively switching off the neuron. Otherwise, the mask value is one. We simply multiply the output of each neuron by its mask before moving on to the next layer. The only layer that's not masked is the output layer itself. During the backward pass, we multiply the derivative uh, with respect to each neuron output y by its mask value. And this is the mask value that was obtained during the forward pass. This is literally the only change to make. Keep in mind that switched off y values, uh, the neuron outputs for neurons that have been switched off, have already been masked in the forward pass and are already zero for these neurons. So in the remaining portion of the pseudocode, you don't have to worry about y values. Some of them have already been switched off and are zero. During the backward pass, the only additional change that we are going to make is that we are going to multiply the derivative of the divergence with respect to the output of individual neurons by their mask value. Now, dropout effectively trains two raised to n possible networks. So on the test data, the bagged output is in principle the ensemble average over all two raised to n possible networks. That's the statistical expectation of the output of the networks as shown in this equation. Here E is the expectation operator, and this expectation is taken over all two raised to n networks that are that can be composed from your n neuron network. The problem is this expectation is computed to over all two raised to n uh, networks. And so if for even small networks with uh, say a thousand neurons, you'd have to take the expectation over two to a two raised to thousand networks and this is not going to be feasible. So we will use this approximation instead. We will say that the expectation of the over the networks is going to be the network over the expectations over the neurons. Remember, the expect the network is a function of all of the neurons. So we are saying the expectation of the network over the neurons is simply the network over the expectation of the neurons. So this is an approximation. It's not it's not precise. It's just an approximation that we make in order to be able to actually use dropout. And now, once we recast it this way, so long as we can compute, it, compute the expected output of the individual neurons for any input, then this function can, function can be easily computed. Each neuron actually has the following activation. That's d times the activation function applied over the over, over its affine input. And d is the Bernoulli variable that decides if the neuron is switched on or off. It has a probability of success alpha. So over the entire ensemble of two raised to n networks, the expected output of the neuron is going to be the expectation of yi, which is going to be the expectation of d times sigma. And the expectation will be simply alpha. 
So the expected value of the output of any neuron over all two raised to n uh, subnets in the ensemble is simply going to be alpha times the output of the expectation in itself. So this is what we will implement during inference time. Now there are a couple of different ways of implementing it. Let me do this over. Uh, let's say I have a neuron which takes in many inputs. You compute the affine value and then you apply an activation. And then this neuron's output goes to several neurons in the next layer. Now I can either multiply this y with alpha and convert it to alpha y. And that's one way to, uh, to, to account for dropout during inference. The output of any neuron that has been, uh, any, every neuron in the network is now multiplied by this alpha, which is the Bernoulli uh, parameter for the Bernoulli variable that was used to decide whether to turn this neuron on or off during training. And then just use that, use alpha y during inference. Alternately, what we can do is, instead of multiplying this guy by alpha, we can uh, multiply the weights, outgoing weights with alpha by, by alpha. And both of these are valid ways of uh, dealing with uh, dropout during entrance time. Alternately, during training, we can replace the activation of all of the neurons by alpha inverse time sigma, where alpha is the Bernoulli parameter for that neuron. This doesn't affect the dropout procedure itself during training. We'll just accept. During testing, we're going to just use sigma, but during training, we're going to use alpha inverse times sigma. We will not modify the weights. So here is the pseudocode for testing with dropout models. It's just a regular forward pass, except now the activations are multiplied by alpha. Here are some typical results comparing models with and without dropout published by Niti Srivastava in 2013. The x-axis here shows training iterations. The y-axis shows classification error on MNIST data. As you can see, including dropout in the training results in large reduc reductions of error in this model. This is the error they got without dropout. This is what they get with dropout. They have, so dropout was very successful and naturally people try to extend it. And so they have, they have naturally been many variation, variations of the idea that have been proposed. So zone out for RNNs, for example, uh, randomly chosen units remain unchanged during a time transition. Or drop connect, instead of switching off individual neurons, you switch off individual connections between neurons. Or shake out, which scales up the weights of randomly selected, uh, the scales up randomly selected weights, and it fixes the remaining weights to a negative constant. Or you have whiteout, which adds or multiplies weight dependent Gaussian noise to the signal on each connection. And there have been several other uh, variations on the theme. So here is the story so far. Gradient descent can be sped up by incremental updates. Convergence can be improved using smoothed updates. The choice of divergence affects both the learned network and the results. Covariate shift between training and test may cause problems and may be handled by batch normalization. Data under specification can result in overfitted models and must be handled by regularization and more constraint, generally deeper network architectures. Dropout is a stochastic data or model erasure method that sometimes forces the network to learn more robust models. There have been other heuristics that we also use for training. Now, uh, one common heuristic is early stopping. We will track the performance, the classification performance on the training data, but also on a held out set of validation data that was not used during training. 
and we will stop training when the performance on this validation data begins to get worse. So this can prevent overfitting to the training data. So here in this example, the performance of the training data might follow the blue curve on the validation data, it might be this red curve. You'd stop the training right at this point because beyond this point, the performance of the validation data is getting rapidly worse. That's why heuristic. Another common heuristic is gradient clipping. Often, the derivative of the divergence with respect to some parameter may be too high because the divergence has a very steep slope at some point with respect to that parameter. And this can prevent your learning from converging or can take your gradient descent into a bad place. So gradient clipping sets a ceiling on the derivatives, like say five. If the derivative exceeds this ceiling, the threshold, then the derivative is capped at the ceiling itself. There are still more heuristics. In many problems, we won't have enough training data. So we can augment the data with distortions of the data we do have, like which are obtained by say, rotating, stretching, or adding noise to the data in the case of images in such a way that the, that the, that the uh, data transformation doesn't actually change the class. And so now you can use these transformed uh, instances of the data uh, to augment the actual training data that you have been updated, that, that you have been provided. And then there are other tricks like normalizing the entire training data to be zero mean and unit variance, which is the equivalent of batch norm on the input. Uh, there are many techniques for how best to initialize the model. And initializing the model properly tends to be very key to actually learning good networks. So there are methods like Xavier initialization, Kaiming's initialization, initialization using singular value decomposition, etc. Uh, and you're going to encounter some of these in your homework. That is a key point. If you have multiple neurons in a layer which have been identically initialized, those two will remain identical through the training. So this is something that must always be avoided. So here is the overall process for setting up a problem. We start by obtaining training data and we use appropriate representations for the inputs and outputs. We choose the network architecture where we uh, make the necessary choices based on what we know of the problem, how much data we have in the domain. More neurons will need more data to train. Deep networks are generally better to represent smooth functions, but they need more data. We will choose the appropriate divergence function for our task. So if it's, if it's a regression prob problem, we might choose L2. Uh, divergence. If it's a classification problem, we might choose Kalbach Leibler. We will choose the appropriate regularization. We're going to choose the right heuristics like batch norm, dropout, etc. We will choose the optimization algorithm like error. Then we will generally perform a grid search over hyperparameters, such as learning rate, regularization parameter, and so on, on held out data. And then once we have all of these set up, we will train. And even then, we will evaluate periodically on validation data for early stopping if it is required. So in closing, in this series of lectures, we have outlined the process of training neural networks. We saw some history. We saw a variety of algorithms. We learned about gradient descent-based techniques, how to use regularization for generalization. Uh, we saw uh, we saw algorithms that will help us converge, the, uh, that, uh, that uh, enhance convergence. We saw a bunch of different heuristics. So now you can apply all of these to train your networks. Eventually, what really works is practice. You will need lots, lots of practice. Practice makes perfect, and your homeworks will help with, help with that. In the uh, next series of lectures, we are going to move on to the next topic, which is convolutional neural networks.